No, I can call him Mr. Narayan. Right? Yes. <laughs> Thank you very much, Mr. Narayan. Um, next speaker, ladies and gentlemen, is Mr. Nitin Seth, the CEO of Inciro. Mr. Seth is passionate about building and transforming businesses, driving innovation, coaching, and building high-performance teams and making a difference to the country. He has a track record of transformational impact across business and not-for-profit uh, situations, ability to drive from strategy to execution, and leading with a lot of passion and integrity. Because I want to hear a share for you. You know, so... Haan, haan, samundar mein utar. Haan, samundar mein utar, lekin ubharne ki bhi soch. You know, the kind of uh, technologies that we've been talking about since morning, I just thought, you know, so I don't come from technology, my name is Panchi, I'm, I'm a filmmaker and a musician, and um, this seems so apt. Haan, samundar mein utar, lekin ubharne ki bhi soch, dubne se pehle, Geharai ka andaza to kar. Yeah, it's almost like an ocean that we've been talking about. Uh, but let's also find out ke is automation ke ocean ki kya geharai hai. Our topic for this session is intelligent automation versus automation. What's the difference and what is the big opportunity? Ladies and gentlemen, please join your hands for Nitin Seth, the CEO of Inceda. Good afternoon. Come on, I know this is just before lunch, but we can have a little more energy. Good afternoon. Okay, slightly better. And I've been speaking at NASCOM conferences for, I know, at least 10 years. But this was the first time, you know, somebody has, you know, recited a share to uh, introduce the topic. So big round of applause for our, uh, for Mr. Panchi. Actually, you know, the share, I don't know how you chose it, but I, I think it really uh, uh, captures the essence of uh, the topic, uh, intelligent automation. Um, so, uh, you know, over the last 15, 20, 20 years, and I would say that, you know, my consulting career with uh, McKinsey, uh, then, you know, Fidelity, more recently in CEDO, uh, you know, I have, you know, I mean, I've been involved with automation. But over the last uh, three, four years, uh, this is just spiraled. This is just spiraled. Automation was always there, but RPA and more recently intelligent automation, the level of activity, uh, the excitement, the hype, uh, I must say, that, you know, that I am seeing is absolutely unprecedented. Um, and there is a, I think there is, a, there is still a question that you know, behind all the excitement, uh, what's the impact? What's the impact? Uh, so the share that you had, uh, that you know, Sumundar mein jao, but you have to come back also, I think was very apt. It's very apt. And I think it, it kind of, you know, how you, I think you applied some kind of artificial intelligence because you have prejudged what I am going to uh, speak about. Because, you know, that's, that's pretty much, you know, what I would like to speak about. Uh, you know, give you, A, some perspectives on intelligent automation and what this beast is. But then really focus on... Uh, what's kind of working, you know, what are the benefits, you know, why is there so much of a hype, uh, what's different, but equally then talk about what some of the challenges are. Because, you know, unless we are aware of them, we solve for them, uh, there will remain a big gap between the promise and reality of intelligent automation. Yeah? And then finally, I would like to share with you how to, you know, put your head up, as our friend said, and share some best practices. Make sense? Is it okay? Yeah? A lot of people are standing, you know, there are chairs here if you'd like to come here. Okay, so what is, what is intelligent automation? So over the last seven, eight years, you know, I've seen a bit of a journey uh, happening. So, you know, we, you know, there has, as I said, uh, workflow automation has always been there um, and it has been driven by scripting. You, know, you write scripts, and you automate processes. Not very complicated, but takes time. Takes time, and traditionally were long projects, were, you know, six to 12 month type of projects, uh, you know, where you would see some results. Over the last four or five years, you know, we, we suddenly had uh, this wave of RPA platforms that hit the market, uh, initially with Blue Prism, but then number of them, uh, Automation Anywhere, UiPath, many of them, 
and there has been a huge, huge wave around RPA and very simply what happened with RPA was that the human writing the scripts was replaced by software robots, you know, which would log in and would track what you're doing and use that graphical interface to then write the code, right? And which, so that was the robotic process automation. It dramatically simplified, it dramatically simplified the, the entire automation process, um, made, it, made, made it, you know, what I call democratized automation. Uh, automation moved from uh, IT, kind of big IT project into something which users, the business, the operation teams could do themselves. So RPA, I think, has been a very, very big kind of game changer, you know, changing from scripting to the software robots. Now, over the last one or two years, we are seeing uh, RPA evolve into uh, intelligent automation. And what is, what is really happening? So this is to the RPA platforms, uh, you know, we're adding artificial intelligence, machine learning, uh, NLP, natural language processing, computer vision. So there are a lot of, uh, there is a lot of AI that is getting added uh, to the, the RPA platforms, which is improving the effectiveness of these platforms, which is also providing ability to deal with unstructured data. Yeah. So, so far automation was largely about structured data. Now it is about unstructured data. And the moment you go to unstructured data and automation there, the scope of processes, the scope of activities that you can automate explodes, explodes, yeah? So that's a little bit of a journey of from workflow automation to RPA to intelligent automation that we see today. Why is it really coming together now? There are three forces, there are three forces that are coming together. The first is, and you know this, you know, that's why we are having this conference that AI and machine learning has come out of the labs and become mainstream, has become mainstream. The, the Google and Facebook and Amazon and Netflix has really led, uh, the, these majors have really led that revolution, but this is now something you know, which is very commercially available. Yeah? The second is data exploding, yeah? because intelligent automation and this AI plus RPA, the AI bit is totally contingent on data. My previous speaker, also talked about that, and with data exploding, that provides you the foundation now to build AI-based applications. Third is the platform providers. There has just been just such a, such a push around that, just such a frenzy around that, that the development of the platform providers is itself uh, pushing intelligent automation and making this very, very real. What does the landscape look like? It's a complicated landscape. It's a complicated landscape, and uh, often you know you talk about just one aspect of it. Yeah. Now the reality is that when you when you think about intelligent automation, there are a plethora of technologies. There are a plethora of technologies that are coming together. There is of course RPA, and all the RPA providers have upgraded their platforms for them to be intelligent. There is, there is NLP, there are virtual agents, and that's been a big, big thing. Over the last three, four years, virtual agents have revolutionized customer service. Every client that I see, this is something that they are, they are using. Neural networks, deep learning, both neural networks and deep learning have truly gone beyond the lab. Over three, four years back, this was really more science, but this is now getting applied. So there are a plethora of platforms that are coming together. But it's not just that. When you think about intelligent automation, platforms is one part of the value chain. And I think that's, you know, for all my uh, technology friends here, I want you to understand the big picture of it. Because just the platform itself does not mean deployment. It certainly does not mean any impact. Yeah, so when you think about how to put intelligent automation to work, there is an upfront design or consulting phase. Uh, without that, nothing will happen. Or if it will happen, it will be poorly, poorly done. Then you have the platforms, and then, there you, then you have implementation. And in implementation, there are a range of players who are playing. Yeah? So when you think about it, platform is the core, but think about the entire value chain. So that's a little bit of a 
of a primer, uh, if you may, on intelligent automation and what's the landscape here. Now let's get to the to the to the heart of the discussion. Yeah, that what's what is really the benefit? What is why is it such a big deal? Why is it that all of us uh, should really should really think about it? So the big thing about intelligent automation is the ease of use. Yeah, it's easy to deploy. The the time to uh, execute on these projects, the effort involved has cut down by an order of magnitude. With that, what has happened is that the cost of these deployments has come down, the, and therefore the return on investment is higher. You know, if you just have the same return but lower cost, your ROI is going to go up. And with that, many automation initiatives, which over the last 10 years were perhaps not viable, have now become viable. Yeah? So that's the big thing that has happened. That's the big thing that has happened, the break-even point for automation projects because of all these technology advancements over the last three to four years has shifted dramatically. Has shifted dramatically. Now for a, for a, for a CEO or a CFO, if you stack rack initiatives, you, know, you would have offshoring, outsourcing, process design, and automation a couple of years back would be perhaps fifth or sixth in that stack rank. Today, because of this technology and shifting the, the cost structure and the ease of application, automation has come pretty much top of the list. Yeah? The second is greater accuracy. Greater accuracy, you, you can enable a lot more straight through processing. In many cases, with application of, of intelligent automation, you're increasing STP throughput rates by 50 to 60 percent. Yeah? And again, the conversation that I'm seeing with CEOs is that while earlier, cost was the big driver for many of these initiatives. That is not the case anymore. Cost is certainly something which is very important, but the accuracy of throughput, the accuracy of the final outcome is increasingly driving decisions. Yeah? So even decisions like, should I offshore it? Should I automate it? While earlier it was a relatively simple decision that you shift and fix, Today, that is not the case, because accuracy from a final outcome perspective uh, is today is a lot more of a value uh, for the business user. A third thing, and which I think practically is the most important benefit, uh, and which is really driving the adoption, is shifting the control to operations. Shifting the control to operations. So automation from being IT projects have now typically become CEO or CFO driven projects. Yeah? Because these are easy to deploy. These are very easy to deploy. They are very prototyping driven. You do not need a lot of development. Yeah? Uh, so that is the big thing. That is why I think the big reason why this is exploding. Because generally in the, in the operations community, the CEO community, there's a certain fatigue uh, with IT cycle times with IT cycle times that you, you, you push anything to IT and it will be like a six to 12 month deliverable. They will even take you know, four or five months to get started. But now I have this and I can literally get, start, get going in a few weeks and I can see some outcome in a couple of weeks. So that is the big thing. These are the top three reasons. The higher ROI, the accuracy, and the shifting the control to operations, which is really driving adoption. But as the AI ML aspects really kick in, the AI ML aspects of intelligent automation kick in, there are, there are very significant customer side benefits, which, which companies are now beginning to realize. The first three are well known, yeah? But with the, with, with the kicking in of the self-learning models, you have greater effectiveness because you can target things better. You have more relevant offerings for your customers more relevant offerings for your customers, more contextualized personalization, personalization and targeting. So what you are seeing, what is happening is that the front end and the back end is getting connected. And intelligent automation is playing a very, very critical role in that. So digital transformation, which was, which started from the front end, automation is enabling that. And this aspect of it, um, the, the ability to personalize 
the offering, the, the front-end offering based on uh, the processing is a very, very big lever. And finally, uh, humanized interaction. Humanized interaction, again, enabled by various uh, AI features, which is a lot more where what the customer sees, um, and you, you see a lot of that through the virtual agents, is more human-like. Yeah? So intelligent automation, to me, is really a game changer. Is a game changer. The ease of the key thing is the is the ease of use, and that has democratized automation. Automation, which used to be the privilege of the ID function, has got democratized. It's very easy to execute, um, and that's what is leading to the growth in its adoption and, and deployment. And today, any digital transformation program that I'm seeing, yeah, so the large enterprises that that you know that I serve and when I look at the digital transformation programs, uh, intelligent automation is certainly, certainly an important part of it. I do not know of a single large enterprise, Fortune 100 company that I am involved with, um, or my firm is involved with, you know, where there's a transformation program and, and intelligent automation is not a part of it. So this is really very, very significant. Uh, because of this, of all the benefits, the, the complexity and the nature of use cases are exploding. So if I look at process automation from more simple data extraction and basic calculation type of uh, processes, it is moving rapidly to more uh, decision-oriented processes. For example, client onboarding. Uh, client on onboarding for financial institutions is a complex process, increasingly automated, increasingly automated. Also from an from a industry perspective, while intelligent automation had its initial roots in the support processes. And when it came to core processes, financial services has tended to lead, simply because financial services is so process intensive. But I now see this uh, taking root in, in many other industries, from uh, you know, retail to, uh, to life sciences to oil, oil and gas. NLP, explosion in NLP. Explosion in NLP, um, so uh, in, in many, many different ways. That's where the entire unstructured uh, data piece is coming in, that masses and masses of unstructured data out there. How do you, how do you ingest that? How do you make sense of it? You know, I talked about onboarding um, you know, for due diligence type of processes, uh, for contract management, contract reviews, all of those type of things. Uh, NLP is playing a big role. Virtual agents, I'm sure everybody is, uh, here is aware of it. Uh, you know, chatbots, various types of chatbots, fully automated chatbots, assisted chatbots. That's become pretty much, uh, pretty much a fact of life today. Uh, neural networks, deep learning, uh, all the digital work you know, that, that I'm seeing uh, you know, involves deep personalization. Uh, and personalization at the heart of it is driven by, by deep learning. So, so really, it's very exciting. You know, when I look at uh, what is happening, there is an explosion happening. Uh, and you, know, uh, you, know, you feel like a child in a candy store that there are so many different things that you could do. And what was not possible earlier is now is just very, very possible. So what's the issue? What's the issue? There is a big challenge. There is a big challenge. Uh, so this is, and then maybe here is you know, where it comes a little bit of um, putting a dampener on the enthusiasm. Yeah, that uh, intelligent automation is a space where I think there is a big gap between activity and final impact. So the activity is frenetic, is feverish, is exploding. But when I look at the final cost impact, it's very different. Yeah? Uh, so when you, when you talk to the users, all the users are very happy. Yeah, because it's very easy for them. But when you talk to the, to the really senior guys, when you talk to the CFO, yeah, he's not very happy. He's not very happy. Why? Because of all the activity, you can show the paper impact, but the final impact on the p and is often not there. Is often not there. Yeah? That is the big challenge that is happening. Why is that? Why is that? The first thing is that, see the strength of, Intelligent automation is also its weakness. The big strength is ease of use. Because of ease of use, 
there is a lot of fragmentation. There's a lot of fragmentation in one enterprise. It's not, uh, you know, you can often have 30 to 40 different uh, RPA automation projects happening, yeah, which are not which are not connected. So there is a lot of fragmentation. There is a fragmentation. There are silos in terms of how processes are getting uh, getting automated, not connected to each other. Different consultants coming in. There is also fragmentation and proliferation in terms of technologies being used. Yeah, what is happening because of this this kind of siloed approach? See, you find in a process, a process doesn't exist very rarely. Does any process exist in isolation? The process is fed by an upstream process, feeds into a downstream process. Yeah, there is no point, you know, improving the cycle time of this process if you're not doing anything to the downstream process. Yeah, and that's the challenge. If you just make the siloed improvements, it does not mean that the overall, the overall, the meta process, you may change the low level process, but does not mean that the meta process, that throughput output is changing. That is the big issue that I see. The second issue that I see is that you may have paper level savings. Yeah. In your, your process, you had 20 FTs, you're showing three FT saving. Yeah. But often it is six people or, or nine people, you know, where you had 30% saving each. How do you get those costs out of the system? How do you get those costs out of the system? Yeah. Often what is happening is that while you show a saving, those costs are not getting out of the system. Those costs are getting redeployed. They're getting redeployed. And that's why CFOs, you know, when I talk to them, um, they tend to be quite skeptical about this. Yeah, uh, and I think what is happening is that, and I think that's where as technologists, you know, we need to be somewhat careful. I see a very product-centric approach to this. There are platforms, there are plethora of platforms, you know, which I showed earlier. Uh, there is a, and each one of them sell a story, sell a dream. Yeah, but how does that link back to the final business outcome? It's, you know, that I think, you know, we are a little, you know, a little weak on. Yeah, so so you know I, I think as technologists you know we need to almost rein in our excitement because the products are good generally the products are good but that is not what is the difference between impact happening or not happening. Let me move on from here. Some more issues: data quality and and my previous the previous speaker also talked about it that uh, you know, AI effectiveness is based on the underlying data quality. Some of the numbers are really staggering. You know, I, I recently was reading a Harvard Business Review report that, you know, which where they have looked at corporate data across the U.S. and said only four percent of data actually meets the quality standards. Four percent. It's like staggering. Yeah. Uh, nine, often um, in AI projects, ninety percent of the time spent has to be on data cleansing. Ninety percent. Nine zero. Yeah. I think that's a big, big reality check. It doesn't always happen. It doesn't always happen. What should be the case doesn't always happen. So you launch into the project, you launch into mod building models, but with fundamentally poor quality of data. And then you repent. Then you repent because the output is not there. Yeah. Weak governance and control. The big thing about RPA is operations having finally having their, their dream fulfilled that they are not dependent on IT. Yeah. But it also leads to governance and control issues. You made the bots, but what about the management, the maintenance of the bots? How do you ensure the bots are in sync? Yeah. So governance and control is, you know, because of the fragmentation and, and mushrooming and the lack of coordination between operations and IT is a very big issue. Expecting too much too soon. When you introduce machine learning, it will take time for the models to tune up. Most time, the operations, the business users do not understand that. When you first introduce a machine learning based model, a dynamic model versus a static model, initially your performance will fall, will fall, because it will take time to tune those models. Yeah? But if you're not setting expectations, 
you will see worse of performance and suddenly the business user says that, hey, what is happening? And finally, the, the social impact, um, that it does create a scare. Because you know, if, you are, if you are not suddenly substituting roles, and these are not just uh, clerical roles, but, but more significant roles with automation, there is a social impact of that. There is a human impact of that. Yeah? So look, you know, while there is a, there is a huge um, opportunity with, with intelligent automation, I also wanted to bring out that at least what I am seeing, you know, there is the whole excitement has not yet translated into real impact. Yeah? So, and there is a question, is this boon or a bane? You know, have, we, have we put uh, a very, it's like you know, giving a Ferrari car in the hands of a kid who, you know, who doesn't know how to drive this Ferrari car. I, that is what it seems like to me today. Yeah? That bottleneck is not technology. The bottleneck is not whether platform A is better than platform B. Yes, that is also a relevant question. But the question is that how are we really designing, using these platforms to design transformation programs? So what does it mean? Um, there, are, there are seven best practices that I would like to suggest to you, what I have seen work. Um, the first and foremost, and which you probably heard me speak now this a few times, that resist the temptation to just get into a client. This is design it as an end-to-end -end program. It has to be an end-to-end -end program, both from a process perspective and also use of technology. Yeah? The second is that you have to start with an overall process design, as opposed to just launching into automation. And when I say process design, it is not for the process in question. You have to start with the more meta process design, because the big lever first is simplification. Yeah? The big lever first is simplification, it is quite stupid to be trying to fix broken processes, which often happens. So you have to take the time um, to, to simplify. Um, and also through that process, uh, a diagnostic process, you prioritize what are the opportunities and you sequence them. Because you, know, you will need to start somewhere. So you know, while end-to-end um, -end and overall process design is a good thing, but uh, you know, if it becomes too big, you will not start anywhere. But, so prioritization is important, but prioritization needs to be informed. The third is establish business outcomes up front. Yeah? That what are the cost savings, you know, what are the productivity savings, and have a mechanism for tracking them. Yeah? I, I'm just surprised, I'm quite shocked that you know, in this entire execution, that's something you know, which has got, um, got kind of missed somewhere. Uh, Bring IT into the project sooner than later. Yeah, I think it's a very important thing. Invest in data quality and security. You know, I made the point. Uh, recognize that it's not a technology project. It's a business transformation. What does it mean? It means that you will, you will need that. You need the senior mandate. You need the CXO, CEO mandate. And you need to think about change management, the communication, the org design, the ones you have taken 30-40% out, what does the organization structure look like? Yeah? People that who have got freed up, some you may want to let go, but what about retraining? So without, without the right change management, this will, this will fail. And finally, joined up governance. Joined up governance between operations, IT, finance, and HR. Yeah? Uh, so you would see that most of my best practices are not technology specific, because again, the success and failure of this Yes, you know, there are platforms that are continuously evolving. Some are somewhat better than others. You know, that's a debate we can have. But the bottleneck is not there. Bottleneck is in terms of how these programs are getting, getting, uh, getting designed. So that's where I would, I would like to stop. Um, thank you. And love to take any questions. Hi, this is Manoj Hans and author of the mobile automation book. So my question is related to the RPA tool. Okay, so as you know, you explain about like uh, we have the lack of uh, government and control if we are thinking about to automate the something, right? 
so uh, my question is in which industry it is suited the best you know like the data is very dynamic so uh, what is your thought on See, i think financial services in my experience is typically led uh, yes. because you know again you know, the data is there and uh, processes there are so many legacy processes uh, that you know i find that yeah financial services in my experience is typically led uh, in the use of uh, deployment of rpa and what would be the feature of this tool if we are uh, talking about like we need to learn only the tool okay so anybody can learn the tool there are lot of tool like blue prism and uh, other tool ui path then what would be the feature if uh, somebody is opted the you know like career in that particular rpa what Sorry, do you think? can you repeat the second question yeah. the second question is related to like uh, we have the lot of tool right now for related to the rpa so if somebody is opted the career in uh, you know like rpa so what would be the you know his career path because this tool can anybody learn you know there are that's no a great coding. question yeah. that's a great question i i it may not be a popular answer but i think building a career just around rpa skill sets or for specific platforms i think is quite limiting yeah exactly is quite limiting uh, so uh, you are absolutely right because those skills are are easy to to learn and that's why you know i tried to show the overall value chain that you know you have design you have the platform you have implementation so you will have a more durable career if you are building understanding of the underlying processes so the first question you ask that you know what industry you know should this be deployed in if you are as a professional you know if you anchor yourself there that these are processes that i understand well um, i think it will be a more mo that will be a more durable knowledge and uh, durable skill sets to have yeah. thanks thanks for the session yeah. uh, my name is shubham bhardwaj i work in the area of rpa and digital transformation uh, so what some of the conversations i have been having with my peers both within my organization and outside is that the perception about rpa is that it's not exactly a transformation program it's more about extending the lifetime of legacy applications and a uh, lot of those what is try trying to do is trying to cover the inefficiencies which have been built over the legacy applications yes yes and uh, the thought is that should we spend money on rpa applications because the license costs are quite huge okay should we spend money there or should we rather kind of look at the next versions of the applications maybe there will be an extended pain for an year or so and try to address those inefficiencies or try to bring over that rp aspect directly into the applications so what's your thought and do you think that's uh, something which is uh, which is i think like that's a fantastic question that's a great question uh, Uh, you know so there are two parts of your question the first is how rpa is deployed today how it is positioned today i agree with you it is today used more as a fix uh, of uh, of existing legacy applications it is not seen as a transformation program but i think that's exactly the problem to my mind and I, that was the thrust of my presentation that don't make that mistake because it is relatively easy to do uh, don't fall into that temptation it can be a transformation uh kind of enabler yeah so first part yes but that's bad practice don't don't get sucked into that kind of easy path the second question is a big, bigger question i don't think it has uh, it is necessarily an rpa or automation question that debate about when do you sunset a legacy application stack and build a fresh versus trying to uh improve the effectiveness throughput from that existing stack it's a bigger discussion it's a bigger discussion uh, uh, you know i don't think you know automation is a is something that you know is an option that is available for you to improve uh, the throughput of that stack but that debate is a, is a bigger debate you know which is about you know, you know where your current stack is what are your business needs um, so i don't think you should limit that to you know you should not you know i would not see it from a prism of automation to me that's a bigger question to be answered uh another question would be and i i would say that again you know throughout my career i've seen that you know the the, the cto organization 
would typically you know have been always the visionaries who want you know that new system to be architected uh, but from a practical business perspective there is always a pushback yeah so you know at least in my, my my experience the number of cases where a new system should have been architected but where you actually do that is probably a fraction yeah so uh, yeah it's a it's a yeah to me it's a it's a big debate uh, Thank you very much. Uh, I think that is all the time we have for questions now. Uh, lunch has already been served, so that should tell you um, how <laughs> people are feeling. People and we, left for lunch. Yeah, yeah, I can imagine. May I please invite on uh, stage Mr. Praveen Kumar? Please do the honors. Can clap? Yes. <laughs> I'm sure after lunch the clapping would come easier. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, just so you know, we had a slightly longer lunch, but you now have 30 minutes. We'll try and come back into this room at uh, 2 o'clock. And we'll start then. Take 30 minutes. We'll see you back here at 2. Thank you. <laughs>